Ms. Stefanik, uh, five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Adams, and thank you to all of our witnesses today for your thoughtful testimony. Women deserve equal pay for equal work, and in the United States, this is the law of the land. Since 1963, it has been illegal to pay different wages to employees of the opposite sex for equal work. Additionally, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act codified non-discrimination rules for employment, making it illegal to discriminate, including through wages, based on race, color, national origin, religion, or sex. The good news is that we have a strong story to tell of women's empowerment in today's economy. The number of women working in America is at a historic high of 74.9 million. And of the 2.8 million jobs created last year, nearly 60% went to women. We know that women are graduating college at higher rates than men and are increasingly their family's primary breadwinners. Let me reiterate my support of equal pay for equal work and voice my desire to strengthen this principle. To do this, we must understand what is actually happening. If you account for factors such as hours worked per week, rate of leaving the labor force, specific industry occupation, and length of time out of the workforce, the wage gap shrinks, but it is not completely eliminated. We must focus on closing this remaining gap. My concern with HR 7 is not with the overall goal, which I strongly support, but with, with how it goes about achieving this goal. I am concerned that aspects of HR 7 appear to be prioritizing trial lawyers, and in some cases, it makes it more difficult for businesses that are acting in good faith to rectify past wrongs and prevent future pay disparity. Despite these concerns, I want to lay out the principles of HR 7 that I strongly support, although I have some concerns about the current drafting. The principles I support are the following. I support the principle of allowing a job applicant to negotiate on the merits of themselves without being saddled by previous salary history. I support the principle of enforcing non-retaliation for pay disclosure by employees. I support the concept of providing workplace negotiation skills training to women. In addition to these principles, I support policies that I believe will help close this remaining wage gap, and we can look at particular governors who have effectively passed bipartisan legislation. I want to build on those current laws, and I want to ask a few questions to Ms. Olson. Ms. Olson, you discussed that today's employees are looking for flexibility in employment, and that increasingly means alternative forms of compensation outside of traditional wages. Could you elaborate on the potential benefits that allowing businesses to have protection for alternative compensation models would have? Absolutely. Uh, it allows it to, you know, in sum, attract, motivate, and retain in the workforce longer men and women all who may have unique um, needs that may not all be compensation-based, but may be based on other benefits of their working life as well as their personal life. And that's not a male-female issue. That's just a worker issue today. And in terms of what employers are doing along those lines is they're looking not just to have different uh, types of payments in terms of wages and other elements of compensation, but also different benefit plans and different opportunities in terms of leave and other issues. And what employers are doing with respect to their own pay audits is really, you know, many, many things. One being really looking at a lot of the data that's used is not necessarily digitized. Making sure that they do audits and they create systems so that they actually can go back and be able to account for what are the differences in pay reviewing it, also reviewing starting pay against what have you been paying people in those jobs that are in the workforce that haven't moved. Don't just pay the new people who are coming in because the market is high and people who've been with you for a number of years. So there's a holistic view of pay that's being done across workplaces today. I want to follow up on that, Ms. Olson. You, as you just did in your testimony, point out that many businesses are looking internally to review their pay practices. And specifically, in your opening statement, you discussed certain state laws that incentivize employers to self-audit their pay systems. Can you elaborate on that and why that is a successful model to close this remaining wage gap? Yeah, it, it really is successful. Um, a number of employers, unfortunately, are concerned that 
their own individual self-critical analyses or views and the way they categorize for statistical reasons different jobs and individuals, et cetera, could be used against them later, no good deed, um, by trial lawyers who say, well, you, you categorized it that way without maybe the benefit of all the information. So if an employer has to build their audit model toward is this going to be subject to legal challenge or is it perfect in terms of that way, it's just so costly. You're using third-party statisticians and a lot of outside consultants to do that, whereas if instead an employer in good faith reviews their pay systems and also takes, and this is what these laws are saying, take good faith efforts for purposes of looking at what they have found and taking steps to eliminate pay differences, that there ought to be one, a privilege with respect to that so it can't be used against them later. And the question isn't, did they come to the right answer? But did they do a diligent analysis and in good faith make good faith decisions with respect to it? It will encourage people. I, I definitely can represent that to this, these subcommittees. It will encourage more employers to do these audits, to make these changes voluntarily and quickly. Thank you. Thank you for the flexibility and the time. I yield back.